Hey everybody, I'm gonna do this my jingle anyway. Hey everybody, I'm Cantonese Cat. Hey everyone. Uh, I just want to give you a quick update. Um, spend about a minute on my X account. Um, I have voluntarily really just destroyed and not destroyed, I guess I should say deactivated my Crypto Canton Cat account. The account no longer exists because I deactivated it. The reason why is not because I don't have any um, control over it. I actually can still lock in, I can do everything with it, but I have a scam app that was embedded within X that has written right per permission. And it was just kind of posting several posts um, back in like the um, August uh, 13, 14, 15, and they've just been quiet. And they reposted something again. There was another scam link that happened between Friday night and Saturday morning. I caught it, I deleted it within 20, 30 minutes. I just couldn't take it anymore for safety of you know myself, for safety of my followers, and for safety of the community. I just went ahead and deactivated my account that had like 20,000 followers that I worked a very hard time to, to build up. Um, I guess I shouldn't think that way. I guess I was just always kind of just sharing my thoughts and if the account grows bigger, great. If not, that's fine too. But I restarted another account called Evil Canton Cat. If you want to follow that one instead, I'll be on there. I might not post as often as I did before. Um, because my confidence in X is a little bit shaken because they really haven't responded to my request to remove that scam app despite me trying to kind of reach out to them for like weeks. So um, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to start a new account. I'm just going to post wherever I feel like posting, but, um, you know, just kind of letting you know what's happening with that. Uh, yeah, this account, as far as I can, I, I know should be clean. There's not really any like embedded apps or anything like that. So it should be fine. The, um, thing uh, I want to talk about really was I made a post and I'm going to make this video maybe like private for members for the night, but I'm going to open it up for tomorrow. Um, I made a post here. Basically, a lot of people are having a lot of fears when it comes to rate cuts being bearish and rate cuts being bearish. Like if the Fed cuts rate, it's uh, the market's going to plummet as a result. So I went back and did some back testing of whether or not that's true. And I basically just look at the Fed funds rate. I basically drew arrow on every single time you have like a significant drop in Fed's funds rate and I see what the S&P 500 have been doing and how it reacts to it over the last 60 years. Really like back testing this, I, I actually don't know what they're talking about because the truth is every single time when you have the Fed's funds rate going down, it doesn't really matter the acceleration or deceleration. Um, overall, there's really been like just twice that the Fed's funds rate, when it plummeted, the S&P 500 plummeted along with it. The most recent time is the great financial crisis. The time before that is the dot-com bubble. So I really don't see anything beyond those two sessions for me to say that, hey, you know, um, decreasing plummeting in fund, uh, Fed funds rate is going to lead to a um, recession or lead to the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ to really plummet. I'm just not really seeing any evidence to support that notion. I think that there were a lot of um, possible, it's not even a correlation, but I think there's a lot of possible thought that, you know, whenever Fed's funds rate need to plummet down like this all the time, from a pretty high level to a pretty low level, there are some concerns that something's wrong with the economy and the Fed has to do that because something's wrong and that could be an indicator, right? Well, they did that during COVID, you know, and um, that, that didn't really, you know, affect the, the market. They did a very, very big plummeting of the Fed funds rate around the early 1990s, and that really didn't cause any shakiness in the market here at all. So I, I actually don't think that the um, the Fed funds rate plummeting leading to a recession is really like a good narrative. I actually think it's a pretty horrible narrative that people hang on to. But hey, you know, what do I know? I just I don't know anything, you know. Um, I'm just showing you the data here and I kind of, I chuckled at something like this, you know, like when I post something like this, showing you the data, showing the arrows and somebody said, um, on here, absolutely not true. Uh, the Fed hiking cycle ends in recession in over 75% of cases. Um, okay. So where, where's the data? I, I, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. If you are worried about these two areas over here and here, I think what happened is not so much that the Fed funds rate was plummeting and that the Fed hike um, cycle or you know is is over or whatever. You know, I think it's more because things are just way over leveraging in the dot com bubble and things are just way over leveraged for the great financial crisis area. I'm going to show you some data as to why I think that is. You know, one th one idea was. Um, First of all, 
to dispute a little bit further about the Fed funds rate, um, the Federal Reserve really they follow remarket conditions. They follow data, and what they say they follow data. There are a bunch of data. They they say they look at like CPI, PPI, blah blah blah. I, I really do think that they actually more follow what the real market or real rates are to kind of set their rates. The truth is the market has already, you know, really um, cut rates for them. Um, the two year and the 10 year has maxed out around October, 2023. They got to around like, you know, the two year was like two, uh, 5.2%. The 10 year was like 5%, and but it both peaked around October, 2023. Matter of fact, it's been just plummeting over the last year and to the point that the 10 year has really gone from like 5% to less than 4%. And you also are already having um, the um, mortgage rates also kind of um, dropping as a result of this before the Fed even does anything. Like the real market, as I actually kind of fascinated into how, how it works, the market has already done the, the job for the Fed and the Fed does nothing except for follow most of the time. That's actually kind of what I'm seeing here. And the funny thing too is, you remember October 2023, right? Remember that the US money supply bottomed here, the quantitative tightening had ended in October 2023. Nobody talks about this. Quantitative tightening ended October, October 2023. And then since then, the US money supply has been going up. Granted, it's not as high as it was before. There's just not enough like liquidity like it was before to really be, you know, thinking about one of those crazy irrational bull market. But if you just look at the log scale here, all we're really doing is just retracing back to the mean, really for the entirety of the um, US liquidity shown here, you can see that it's just been on a straight line up and we got a little bit too deviated from the line and right now we're just kind of retracing back to the mean. So I think that most likely money supply is just gonna keep going up over time and there's really no indication that it's gonna stop anytime soon. The interesting thing though, right? The bottom of the um, of the quantitative tightening cycle happened October 2023. The market also bottomed on SP500. You have a big giant scare from like July all the way to October 2023. Bottomed in October 2023, right? NASDAQ did the same, right? QQQ um, did the same. And you also have the IWM also did the same, right? So as far as I'm concerned, there are a lot of these kind of confluences really telling me that, hey, there's going to be increasing liquidity coming in. Hey, there's no guarantee that um, things are like over leveraging that you have to have like this big giant deleveraging that has to happen. And I'm going to show you some data for that. And hey, you know, there's increasing money supply and, um, you know, they might end up just being uh, having a lot more money being flushed in the system moving forward. Right. So what I mean by over leverage back in the dot com bubble and you can see this. I'm going to pull up the, um, actually, instead of SPY, I'm going to pull up the SPX chart. Um, and you can see that on the six month, I just pulled the Bollinger Band. During the um, dot com bubble era, you're asking for great deleveraging to happen. The reason why I say that is because never had history of the stock market had this happened. Never had the history of stock market had this happen until the dot com bubble where the six month candle number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten in a row, ten six month candles over a five year period span where it was just closing about the upper Bologna band. Like you're just asking for punishment at that point. If if you have continuation of this big giant bull trend way overextended, you're asking for a big correction to happen that retraces back to the mean. That's exactly what it did, right? For three years in a row, that's exactly what it did, right? And you can argue that, yeah, things trying to recover, then what happened here? Like if you're already saying that you already had the deleveraging happen here, then why is she having another great financial crisis that also plumb all the way back down to, by the way, right to the lower bull in Japan. It's kind of funny how technical analysis work, doesn't it? If you worry about this being support, well, if it breaks down, where is it gonna find support at the below bull in Japan? for the great financial crisis, one of the greatest, you know, financial disaster that the world has ever witnessed, right? It found support here at the low Bollinger Band on the, the six month chart. But what we're seeing here is too, right? COVID, you can see that things are over leveraged, right? Because they increase liquidity, you have three big giant green candles over here closing way above the upper Bollinger Band. And you haven't had a big giant bad baddie 
2022 candles you're really trying to erase both of these right so yeah you when you have over leveraging happen you have deleveraging are we over leveraged right now based on the bullish mass strategy doesn't seem to be it looks like it's like a bull trend moving up and to kind of ride up along the upper bull in japan on the bull market is not unusual it's just whenever things get a little bit too far overextended on the six month chart whenever things get a little bit too leveraged you know you go down back down a little bit right same thing over here you know you have um, in the in the 50s you have like four or five candles in a row here and then end up pricing pricing them through nothing for like two or three years after that right so I think what happened here is really more just deleveraging that happened rather than oh the Fed the, the Fed is cutting rates like it, it doesn't I think it's just deleveraging the same thing happened over here but rather than money staying here in the S and P five hundred the large gaps money actually rotated here to the Russell um, to Russell two thousand around that era what happened was instead of being continue to over leverage on the big of uh, the large caps. They rotated money into the small cap. So the small cap actually has some pretty strong um, over leveraging here as well, where you have a few candles kind of really closing about the six month um, upper bullish trend here. And that also ended up having significant deleveraging because of that, right? So yeah, and you can see that the Russell 2000, um, ever since this had happened, they really had rotated a lot of money from large cap over to small cap during the period of like around 2001 all the way to 2007 before everything just kind of plummeted they really did a lot of money rotation they were pumping up the russell and then everything just kind of plummeted together right and then ever since that happened um the russell a lot of people think that the russell 2000 is always doing much worse than the um s p 500 that's not always the case really actually from the um dot com bubble burst all the way to the great financial crisis they really have been more over leveraging onto the small caps, right? To the point that you, you have a little bit of exhaustion. This is a Russell 2000 over S&P 500 chart. And that kind of tells you how small caps are doing in relation to large caps. The higher it is, the better small cap does. The lower it is, the worse the small cap does against large caps, right? And really for about a whole um, decade or decade and a half or so, small cap has been outperforming large caps significantly all the way from like, you know, um, 1999 to around May of 2011. And this, last part over here happened on um, significant bearish divergence um, where you have the ratio continue to go up but the RSI continue to go down and you know this trend is exhausting and you know that probably things are going to end up rotating back away from the large uh, from the small caps back to large caps right and that has certainly happened for the entire um, decade decade and a half almost where large cap has just been outperforming small caps to the point that everybody just kind of took it has like a common knowledge that small caps don't do anything and that large cap is always going to outperform small caps it's just not always true it's only true because people feel that way over the last 15 years right where russell 2000 has just been severely out underperforming the um the uh, large cap so the biggest thing here too though is just like i saw a bearish divergence over here for this ratio and i think that that might be the reason as to why small cap has underperformed large caps for the last you know 15 years or so we're also seeing a very strong monthly bullish divergence on the ratio where it might be over the next decade that money might end up rotating from large caps back to small caps um, just because usually these things change trend every once in a while and it looks like we might be changing the trend here soon just looking at the bullish divergence in terms of how um, small cap Russell 2000 is going to potentially outperform the S&P 500. Now, it doesn't mean that um, it's not going to keep going down, you know, on bullish divergence, but it's just a lot of energy that's being built up here. Whenever small cap runs, there's a potential small cap can outshine the large cap for quite some time. And it might be very surprising to a lot of people that have been already kind of believing in the dogma that small caps are always going to underperform large caps. It's not always going to be the case. It wasn't always the case and it wasn't always going to be the case. And there are data that I'm seeing here based on technical analysis to tell us that maybe that's going to change soon. So if you are worried about over leveraging, the blue line over here um, is basically the uh, amount of the debit balances in margin, right? We have had some you know, pretty significant margin that has been building up um, compared to how it was throughout 2020, 2023. Right now we do have you know, increase in margin debt, but it's nowhere near the peak 
of the um, 2021 hype cycle, right? And I do believe that Marshall Depp is just gonna, it's just like Depp in general, it's just gonna go through, go increase over time. But right now we are not forming a higher high in that. And I just don't really see things necessarily being too irrationally um, overextended. And it's just like previously, like even after the great financial crisis, you have significant deleveraging that happened, right? We already had the deleveraging with this big giant U over here. We already had the deleveraging with this big giant U right here. So I think that the leverage environment, we might be a little bit closer to around like 2010, 2011, um, somewhere around here. But imagine like how bad, how, how big the bull market just kept on going for a very long time, right? I think we might still be an area where it's just not really that over leverage at this particular moment in time. So I, I don't really believe in the big giant plummet that's just going to happen. I think we already had a pretty significant deleveraging where margin debt had really decreased by more than like 30%. Um, and that was very, very healthy. That was very, very much needed. Um, right now, yeah, we're, we're getting a little bit more of a leverage environment, but um, I actually don't know whether or not this is necessarily unhealthy because overall it's just like a big trend line going up and I think we're just basically retracing back to the mean at this point. So um, those are my thoughts. Um, it might be silly thoughts. It may not be anything that other people are saying out there and it may not be fitting a lot of the narratives that are going out there. I don't care. I'm just here to kind of show you what I'm seeing here. And what I'm seeing is really still at this moment on the bigger cycle, there's still not a whole heck of a lot to worry about. And I just cannot simply be that bearish if the IW chart looks like this, where it just keeps on forming higher high and your big giant wick underneath below over here. On the background of the Nikkei, having had this big giant, like greater than like 30% drop over here and everything just got immediately just bought right back up. Like I cannot be bearish on this big giant dragonfly candle over here. This is a bullish development. And it takes something like this to happen for you to drop price down. And if it takes you to have, and, and if this is a form of deleveraging by the way, you know, and, and, and this was actually probably much needed because the Nikai just kind of went parabolic for about a whole year and a half. So this is actually much needed by the way. If you have something like this to trying to get people to be all scared and sell out the market, and if you have to have VIX going all the way to like greater than 60, and it hasn't done that really ever since um, the um, COVID shutdown where everything was shut down, and it hasn't done that ever since the great financial crisis. If you have VIX going all the way up to 60, and people are still thinking that September is going to be a horrible month, that VIX is going to push all the way back up to the level again, which historically is very, very rare. This is just, I'm going back to all the way to like 1990. This is like the third biggest um, level of VIX I've seen really ever since, you know, the COVID shutdowns and also the great financial crisis. Like even the dot-com bubble burst didn't do that. So if it takes VIX to go up to 60 for, they, for them to do what they did to plumb the price, I just have a hard time really seeing um, these like great fears of like rate cuts going to plumb the market down further. I'm just not seeing it. Call me a skeptic. Um, I, I'm generally more you know bullish than bearish, especially after the stock market, especially after Nasdaq already had multiple crashes over the last seven years. You're talking about, especially over the last seven years, you've had the um, the crash in um, 2018 to 2000, yeah, 2018 from the um, trade conflict, you know, that President Trump has imposed. You had a great drop here for COVID that has plummeted. And you also had a great um, deleveraging that happened in 2022. So you're really talking about like three big giant crashes that happened within a period of how many years? Like six, less, like six seven years. And people are calling for a crash again. Like it's just statistically, it just doesn't happen that often, right? So 
I am not that worried for a longer term. I think 2025 probably would be a be pretty decent year. It doesn't have to. We can definitely chop around 2025, and that could be a lost year because there is some concern that we are maybe a little bit, you know, over leveraged. But overall, like a, a bull trend is a bull trend. Just let's just call it what it is. Um, and whenever you have a pretty nice bull trend that's going on right now, I have a hard time calling the top, and I don't know whether or not calling a top is something that one's, one, uh, one should be doing. Initially, I was a little bit concerned. I'm gonna show you this last thing here. I'm gonna call it a night here. Initially, I was a little bit concerned here on the, um, sorry, on the higher time frame chart here. Uh, let me see, was it a three month? Actually, I think it's more the SPY. Initially, I was a little bit more concerned about, yes, it was the SPY. Initially, I was more concerned about this trend line over here. And I might still be a little bit concerned about it too, right? We are hitting this trend line. We are hitting some pretty strong resistance. I don't want you to think that I'm like a blind bull. Like there is a potential where the current level right now is some very, very strong resistance, you know? The interesting thing though, is that was the S&P 500 index fund with the, with the, um, with the um, SPY and that was hitting resistance. But if you look at SPX, if you look at SPX, we actually have broken this trend line, which is very, very interesting. If you look at SPX, we actually have broken the trend line here um, by the monthly close. SME 500 is a little bit funny because um, SPY does take into like dividends. So they actually might underperform a little bit, um, you know, based on a raw number, based on SPX versus SPY. So I would go more purely more on SPX in terms of what you think the actual market is doing. And it just broke about this like negative trend line over here that we've had for really since like 2018. So on the SPY, yeah, a little bit more caution is needed because it's right at the resistance right here. But the SPX is kind of telling you a little bit of a different story. So anyway, we'll see how the market works out. I just don't think that it's going to be that bad. If anything, I do think the IWM might potentially outperform the S&P 500 for the next 12 to 18 months, and we'll see kind of how things are. But uh, I'm just not that scared right now, despite the scary narratives that are going on right now. Just like I wasn't scared when things were around like June, when Jamie Dimon was saying that there's an economic hurricane that's coming. I was buying very heavily in June of 2022. And even leverage position, they went down a lot more with this flush down here but it's been up, you know, a lot ever since. So I, I wasn't scared by this big giant plum, you know, um, movement over here from July to August of um, 2023. And I am not that scared right now, although, yeah, you, if you have some deleveraging, it can happen. If SPY hit the resistance line over here, if it ends up going back down to back test, you know, this level down here again, I, I argue we already did that with the wake in August. I argue we already did that. So. I'm just going to sit tight, you know, with the market and see what the market does. I'm going to sit tight with the U.S. money supply that seems to be going up. I'm going to sit tight with um, the rates um, dropping, which tells me that it's going to be easier for, to, to get debt. And uh, we'll see what happens. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. You know, I, I don't want you to just kind of blindly follow me. Uh, but I just want to kind of give an alternative um, thought in terms of what I think about macroeconomics and what other people are kind of talking about. Anyway, have a good one. Bye.